All right, welcome again. We're going to go ahead and um, start into our unit on chemical bonding. Um, now, some of these things will be reviewed. So for those things that are reviewed, I may speed up and go through them fairly quickly. Um, but you can always rewind and come back to it, and we'll be able to go from there. Now, chemical bonding. There are main, there are three main, sorry, types of bonding that we're going to look at. But the first thing we need to understand that is that chemical bonds are what holds atoms together by different means, and we're going to discuss those different means in just a few moments. Now, our three types of bonds are ionic, which are held together by electrostatic forces, or the difference in charges. Examples, some of the, the examples we've used before, sodium chloride, um, potassium bromide, anything that has a charge, positive and negative charge, will usually be attractive. Second, covalent which we talk about as well in detail, where we're going to share electrons. All of these are going to take place from the valence electrons. And also metallic bonds, which we're going to look at uh, for the first time. But we say it's sort of like the nuclei are floating in a sea of electrons. And we'll explain that in just a second. Now, this is sort of a diagram that shows the different ways that we'll look into this. Um, if you notice, ionic and metallic are very fairly simple. Once you understand the concept, they usually don't get too much more difficult. But covalent breaks down into a few more areas um, between polar and nonpolar. And then even once we get to polar, different types of polar bonding that will take place. Um, and most of these will be intermolecular instead of intramolecular. But we'll go through that in just a few moments. Now, a few ideas that we're looking at for the Lewis structures and different things like this. You have these in your notes, so um, you can always refer back to it. But just giving you an idea of what the Lewis structure would look like, the electron configuration, and so forth. Now, the valence electrons are going to be the outermost electrons. Those are the ones that are the furthest out in terms of the orbitals that these um, elements have. These are the ones that are going to participate in the bonding. Now, we can find this by looking at our periodic table in the group that has an A next to it with a number is going to tell us how many um, valence electrons it has. Now, a couple exceptions to that. If you're looking at the D or F block, those are transition and intertransition metals. Those will not have, um, you won't be able to use this trick, but usually that information will be given to you or there'll be a way for you to find it. Now, octet rule. This is the quote unquote goal of the atoms. It wants to be stable. And one of the things that will help it to be stable is to look at the outer valence shell being completely full. Now, we say that it wants to achieve noble gas electron configuration, meaning it's going to gain electrons or lose electrons in order to um, reach this status. Now, with that, don't think of it as it's actually making the decision that it wants to be. Um, or it's already going to lose these electrons or gain these electrons. It's going to be based on um, the situation that is given when it's put into a bonding situation. It may lose or gain accordingly. Exceptions. Hydrogen only needs two electrons to be filled, so it's not going to go all the way to the full eight. Now, Coulomb's law. <coughs> we want to look at Coulomb's law in terms of um, our different types of bonding, but in my mind it comes more into play when we deal with ionic bonding. Why? Because we have to deal with some charges that are going to come into play. Where Q is going to be our charge of our, Q1 is charge of our metal, and Q2 is our charge of our nonmetal. And R stands for the radius. Now, bond energy or bond dissociation energy is the energy needed to break a bond. So this is actually going to become very important as we continue to go throughout this unit. Now, this is a diagram showing the effective range, I guess you would say, of um, energy in, within a bonding situation. What do I mean? If you look at the top here, you notice that we have these two hydrogen atoms, but they're very far away from each other. Because they're so far away, their radii don't even interact, and therefore there's no pull from the nucleus on the electrons of the adjacent atom. But as we move them closer, that range gets a little bit a little bit better, and there is actually a decrease in energy. Until they reach a certain point, 
which in this case it gives you the bond length here for the hydrogen saying that the energy is lowest at 0 0.074 um, nanometers which is negative 458 kilojoules per mole of energy any closer than this and then the, the repulsive forces of the protons of the nuclei begin to push each other apart so this is the effective range where there's still that pull from the nucleus on the electrons of another element but it's not too far where it has to force itself apart now some of these things we've covered and so just making sure that you're with us on this um, metallic bonds we said is C of valence electrons and what this means is um, you're going to have the nuclei and actually let me go ahead and pull this up for you if I'm looking at a situation of a metallic bond I'm going to have my nuclei that are floating here and around these nuclei I'm going to have some electrons that are here. So E minus, E minus, E minus. Now, these electrons are what we call delocalized, which means they have the ability to move um, from side to side. They're not bound to being just around one atom. Now, because of this and because of how electrons move, they, they tend to have a random pattern to, which, to where they move. So at different points within um, the millisecond or different things like that or the life of the metal the electrons will be moving about because they're moving there'll be some times where they'll be more concentrated to this side if they're more concentrated here on the left then that means this left side would have a negative charge and the, the other side would have a positive charge but this can easily switch and this will switch very often where you'll have the electrons now moving in this direction which would then switch the charge. This constant changing of, of charge allows the metal to stick together and this is one of the main concepts that we'll look at when it comes to this portion. Now, covalent bonds we said again is sharing electrons so, and we're going to talk more about that in a second and ionic bonds would be the transfer of electrons. These two things will be very important, especially when we draw Lewis structures. If I draw the Lewis structure for an ionic compound, then my expectation is that I'm showing that there was, a, there was already an electron transferred over, meaning I'm going to have a charge on it. Now, ionic bonds form between an element of low ionization energy, or they don't, that doesn't need a lot of energy to pull off the first valence electron, and an electron or element of high electron affinity, which means it has a stronger pull. Now, covalent bonds, a couple of things. First off, covalent bonds we said share to fill the valence shell and usually form between two nonmetals. Key point. Now, the Lewis structures are what we use in order to show um, the bonds or how the electrons are shared. Let's look at our first example. If I'm going to make a Cl2 molecule, we notice that each chlorine has seven valence electrons. We look at the periodic table and see it's in group 7A. So if I have two chlorines, each one just needs one valence electron. In order to be stable, what it's going to do is it's going to form a bond with another chlorine. This bond that's shared between this red pair is the shared bond we can also use a couple of other methods to show it. The main ones we'll use is either the Lewis dot with the two dots between or we can use a line to represent that there's a bond. Each line or each dash represents two electrons or a pair of electrons that's being shared. So looking at these examples we have our CL2 rewritten with our Lewis structure with the lone pairs all around with a dash between similar for our hydrofluoric acid, water and so forth so you can sort of get an idea of what's coming up. Now, the beautiful thing with covalent bonds is that you can actually have multiple bonds. So, when we look at the idea of a single bond, we're looking at, just like we have with our chlorine, only a single pair of electrons are shared, or two electrons are shared. With a double bond, of course, you can expect that four electrons are shared, or two pairs. Triple bond, 
would be six electrons shared. Now, with each of these bonds, there are also varying degrees of strength and length. A couple of examples, here we have hydrogen gas and our oxygen and nitrogen. Each, the three of these are diatomic elements, so you notice that they're paired with another one that is just like them in order to be stable. But each one has a different bond structure. Now, the length and strength part comes in now. So for the, using these examples that are given to us, single bonds are going to be the longest and weakest um, covalent bonds. Thinking in my mind of very strong, very tall people, um, usually early on in life they're very tall, they're very thin, but they're not usually very strong. Whereas as we get some of the shorter, um, the shorter people, we tend to notice that they tend to be a little bit more strong, a little bit more balanced. Now, triple bonds are going to be the shortest and strongest of our types of bonds. But ionic bonds are much stronger than covalent bonds because of that difference in the charge, because of that pull. Think of two magnets coming together, it's going to be a little bit stronger. Now, with this, now we have to introduce the, the idea of polarity and how we will be able to tell what type of bond we have. The main way we're going to do this is we're going to look at electronegativity. Now, electronegativity describes an atom's attraction to the electron pair in a bond. It's a number from 0 to 4.0. Now, what does that mean? If I am, if I have a high electronegative value, negativity value, that means I'll have the strength to pull more electrons or to attract electrons from another atom. And that's the goal in order to reach the stability, especially within covalent bonds. Now, the difference between electronegativities indicate whether it'll be nonpolar, polar, or ionic. And we have a nice little scale that we're going to use for this. But there is no sharp distinction between the bonding types. What do I mean? So if I have one that is 0.4, it says that it's nonpolar, but it also really could fit into a slightly polar, whereas also 2.0. Um, 2.1, sorry, that range can also be slightly polar or it can be ionic. Depends on the situation, what are the elements that are actually bonding. So you want to keep this in mind as sort of a guideline, but not really as a hard set rule. And this is a table that we can use to find the electronegativity values. We're noticing that the higher um, electronegative values, neg negativity values, sorry, are on the right side of the periodic table. It tends to increase as you go to the left and decrease as you go down the group. So these are something that you can keep in mind that as we look at these different bonds, as we look at the structures and different things that we're doing, we even start to see that this has a, a place to play in our acid and base uh, reactions. Which ones are weak versus which acids are strong. It has a little bit to do with the electronegativity value. Now, <coughs> bond polarity helps us to describe the sharing of electrons and atoms. There are three possibilities. Nonpolar, where they're sharing equally. Polar, where we have unequal sharing. Or ionic, where we completely transfer. Now, a molecule that has one side slightly positive and one side slightly negative is said to be a dipole. Di meaning two, pole meaning that it has the two opposite charges. So we're going to continue to go for this throughout the rest of the time. But the positive end of a pole or in a polar bond is represented by this is a delta positive or the negative pole would be a delta negative is lowercase delta. So if you see these symbols, that's what it's saying. It's slightly positive or slightly ne negative. The arrow can also help us to see which ones, where the poles are. Now, one way to tell whether we have something that is polar or nonpolar in terms of our covalent compounds. This is an experiment that was done, and it's um, showing that there is a, in the first example, that there is a slight pole here. But when we put it in place or next to charged particles, we're noticing that all of the charges face the opposite way. So the slightly positive end is attracted to the, to the negative side, and the slightly negative end is attracted to the positive side. 
these are just little things to keep in mind and it helps us to see the relationship and how these molecules actually work. We're going to go ahead and wrap this part up and come back for part two where we'll be able to go a little bit deeper into ionic bonding.